Okay, random forest. So this is the model that I usually use now. I've, I've done work using multiple regression models, and I've done imputation modeling, which I really like. This is random forest run through an imputation model. So what I mean by that is, with random forest, you have a choice whether to run it in regression mode or in classification mode. And um, I've had more success running it in classification mode. And we call that random forest algorithm from a package that's been developed in our lab called YAMQ, developed by Nick Kirkston in our lab. And it has other alternatives for, for KNN imputation modeling. Random forest is just one of them. But it's what I've found the most accurate of the imputation methods available. These sort of plots here are something you get from random forest that are really helpful for variable selection. Random forest, um, well, back up. You've probably heard of classification and regression trees. This is an approach for classification, but it gives you one output, one classification tree based on your predictor variables. Random forest bootstraps to your data and randomly selects data to include the model with each iteration and withholds like 30% 30, 30 of the data for validation. And it also randomly selects from your among your set of candidate predictor variables. So it's a way to assess variable importance through doing multiple iterations of the model. So typically, the default is to do 500 regression trees. And you can play with that parameter until you get a stable solution. Because every time you hit the button, it's going to give you a slightly different answer. So you might want to boost it to 1,000 or 2,000 regression trees. But because of this random variable selection and random permutation to your data, um, you get a much more robust model by this bootstrapping approach. And so it can count the, the terminal node structure and all these this random forest of regression trees to assess variable importance. And now these plots here show variable rankings in terms of importance. There's two different measures of variable importance that are plotted on the, the x-axis here. This is for the 2003 model, and then this is for the 2009 model over here. And on the y-axis are individual metrics that are proved to be important. So in 2003, the most important metric at the top of these graphs with the, the highest importance value is mean height. And that was um, not too surprising, because we expected mean height to be a powerful predictor for plot level <coughs> biomass. It was the most powerful predictor by far, too, in 2009. And then you get this variety of other predictors. Here's maximum height, um, stratum 5, so that's an upper canopy level density stratum between 20 and 30 meters. Stratum 4, that's selected down here. Um, was the one below that. Um, skewness, kurtos, here's skewness of the height values. Over here in 2009, I think there was maybe an intensity skew metric, because you can generate those same metrics from the intensity values. And in fact, if you haven't normalized your intensity values, something like the skewness or kurtosis or a standard deviation um, might be a more useful metric because um, normalizing the intensity values isn't going to change really the variance structure of the data at the local level of a bucket. Okay, It'll change the relative intensities over the broader LIDAR survey, but not so much at the bucket level that you're using to model and map. Okay, and so anyway, these are the metrics. They, they tend to be, for these types of models, for a healthy forest, predicting something like biomass or basal area or volume, you tend to get mean height, maximum height, higher height percentiles. Um, here's a, I think there's a 90th percentile over here. 90th percentile is highly correlated to maximum height. And what I like to do is sort of manually prune through these metrics and choose metrics that 
I choose not to include metrics in the same model that are very highly correlated. All right. So you'll see in a random forest plot maybe mean height, median height near the top. I'll probably throw one out. You don't really have to. Random forest is robust for highly correlated data, especially provided you have a lot of plots. But for the sake of parsimony and simplicity, which we all like in our models, I like to prune anything that's more than 90% correlated with something else that's been selected. So now focusing on this mean height metric, I've plotted mean height on the x-axis in these plots. The two plots on the top are from the 2003 and 2009 biomass. And, or no, I'm, I'm sorry, they're both 2003. The left, that's right, these are the plot, the model units, okay, the field plots. And over the right is just a systematic sample of pixels across the entire landscape. And we have a nice linear relationship between mean height and predicted biomass in both years, or in, in both samples. And so the slope is similar. This tells me that our plot samples did a very good job of representing the landscape. The next pair of plots down are the 2009 comparisons. Similar slopes, um, similar between a plot sample and a systematic pixel sample. And then down here, the bottom two graphs are the change differences. So I, again, plotted plots that were classified as undisturbed as zeros and disturbed plots as pluses. And then same with the landscape sample. If the pixel lost more than 66 megagrams, we call it disturbed. Similar slopes. So very comparable results between 2003 and 2009. And also, it's interesting that these are linear relationships. If, if I, I plotted biomass as a function of maximum height, it's not so linear. Okay? And in fact, if I were in a lot of landscapes with more of an old forest, with more older forest, it tends to be less linear too. This is an actively managed forest, and so a lot of the forest is still doing a lot of height growth, and not so much diameter growth. So it tends to be a nice linear response. OK, this is another way to present um, observed versus predicted. Now, everything I've presented so far was based on predicting tree biomass. And so this top pair of bars in the bar charts are observed versus predicted biomass in our field plots. But now also, we have all these other variables that we measured in our field plots. We have saplings, shrubs, coarse woody debris, fine woody debris. And now this starts to become relevant to fuels mapping. Litter depth and duck depth. Now, OK. I told you I'm Catholic, but I, now I have to confess a sin. <laughs> Two days ago, I gave a talk over at the Northern Forestry Center, and I got a question after the talk. Can you use LiDAR to map wood fiber or wood quality? And I pretty much dismissed it. It's a crazy talk. But now Nicholas here said it straight this morning that indeed, you know, with clever modeling approaches, you can get at that. And so you can, and I'm here to propose as ludicrous an idea that you can use LiDAR to get something like duff depth, or of course woody debris. And the trick here, the modeling trick here is imputation modeling, where you can model multiple response variables. So even though the imputation models that we developed here for biomass are strictly conditioned on tree biomass, we have all those other plot measurements that we've made. We're, we're already assigning tree biomass measures that we made in the plots to unsampled locations across our whole landscape. Why not also assign the other attributes you measured in the plots? 
We got on our hands and knees with our no-go no gauges and measured plywoody debris. We've got a number associated with that plot. So we can assign that number to unsampled locations on the landscape too and generate a map. Now, how good is the map? Well, that's an open question. But at the plot level, we didn't see any evidence of um, bias in our predictions. The predictions through this imputation approach were always close to what was observed at that plot level. So all these variables here, besides tree biomass, they're just along for the ride. They're not really weighting the model at all. Here are some of those maps. So the upper two maps are sapling biomass, 2003 and 2009. Similar patterns, which is encouraging. The next pair of plots, 2003 and 2009, shrub biomass. Again, similar patterns. And then at the bottom, I've got coarse woody debris biomass, 2003 and 2009. Are the maps any good? Well, we'll see. One thing I thought to do before having um, more recent information was, okay, well, let's just plot the change in these other biomass pools as a function of the change of tree biomass. So if these plots show the, the tree biomass change on the x-axis, and then the y-axis show these other pools, saplings, shrubs, coarse woody debris, and then we even tallied up stumps in our plot. So I could derive an estimate of how much biomass was cut and taken out of the truck. And then I drew these, these thin gray lines. This is that arbitrary biomass threshold of change of 66 micrograms per hectare biomass loss. So to the right of that threshold, it's just a shotgun. These are the undisturbed plots. And there's no insight at all about the biomass change pool, the, the biomass change in those other pools. However, in the harvested plots, there are significant trends. And you could say these trends might be a function of the magnitude of the harvest. There's a lot of different kind of harvest activities that go on in Moscow Martin. Uh, very little clear cutting now, so usually leaf trees, thinning of varying densities. And so there's this distribution of harvest intensity. And time since harvest is convolved in this too, okay? I'm not really considering that. But anyway, saplings, you see more saplings in stands that classify as less severely harvest disturbed for an awkward way to describe that. Well, that makes sense, because as the stand's regenerating, it's regaining some of that biomass, right? And then where you find more saplings, you tend to find fewer shrubs, all right? Stands that are approaching more clear-cut situation, so much available light, um, tend to be very shrubby. Or they might be just recently re um, harvested, and so the regen is still very small and still shrub-dominated. So I think that explains this weak trend. But then there's a really strong coarse woody debris trend here. And I thought this was interesting. Because typically on Moscow Mountain, after they've harvested and they have this slash, they'll pile it up and then burn the slash piles in the spring or the fall or even in the winter. And so where they've done a lot of harvesting activity within the boundary of that stand, um, there's less coarse woody debris because they've piled it up. They removed it. So this, this trend makes sense to me, too. OK. So now, how about explicit fuels mapping, though? Everything I've shown you just up until now, the fuels variables, like the surface fuels, say coarse woody debris, um, they're just mapped as ancillary variables. They're not really being explicitly modeled. So then I, I pulled Mike Volkowski in. He's a PhD student I funded. He's now at Michigan Tech. And he published a paper in 2005 where he mapped fuel variables based on just aster imagery. So he's got a fuel model map, a crown closure, and a canopy bulk density map that he derived from, from aster imagery. I said to Mike, hey, we got the LIDAR. Why don't you just rerun these models but include LIDAR predictors and see how much better they get? 
So he's done that. So I didn't exactly, I wasn't super successful in matching the colors of his figure in the paper. But here is a map now generated from Aster and LiDAR. And very similar patterns, OK, for money map previously. So that's for fuel model. This is a categorical variable. And there's, I guess, about five different fuel model types across Moscow Mountain. So let's look at a random forest importance plot. So again, here in this plot, the x-axis is importance, variable importance. So you go to the right, the variables become more important. And we'll label it here model improvement ratio. So these are the variables that do the most to improve your predictive model. And up here, the two top variables are still the aster variables for fuel model. So aster actually turned out to be more useful. But when you add all these different LiDAR metrics in, it actually does significantly increase your predictive power, and you get a better model. The classification error, remember this is a categorical variable, was 26%. OK, let's look at another one. Let's look at the one on the bottom, crumb bulk density. So this is the new map we've generated now, adding in LiDAR predictors get a crown bulk density. Again, a similar pattern, not as similar, because what, you know, previously with surface fuels, this is a canopy fuel variable, and there's been a lot of harvesting. So, oh wait, no, never mind. This is the 2003 LiDAR, that's right. We're using the old LiDAR for this. So there's similarity in pattern, and then when you look at the crown bulk density model, we're explaining 52% of variation now, including the LiDAR data. And the LiDAR are, is definitely more, more predictive power. Here is mean height. Number one again, mean height. That makes sense. Crawling bulk density is not so different from <coughs> the kind of variation that would be selected like in a biomass model. Median height is another big one, highly correlated to mean height. 75th percentile of height. Now here's the green-red index of aster. So we do have a couple aster <laughs> variables in there. A couple intensity variables. And then here's density down here. Here's canopy base height. Which, ver which um, variables are being selected? Number one, again, is an aster variable, which surprised me. But then everything else was LiDAR. Um, skewness and kurtosis of intensity. Now these are unnormalized intensities, so metrics such as this shouldn't be too subject to that potential complication. And lower intensity metrics. So, and then here is 90th and 100 percentile of height. So now we're explaining only 34 percent of variation. And then finally, of course, we need debris. Here is LiDAR and Aster together. A um, couple Aster variables, mostly LiDAR. So here's sort of a summary of using LiDAR and Aster for these various for these four different fuel-related attributes. So fuel model, combining the two types of data, produced the smallest classification error for that categorical variable. The other variables here are continuous. And so I'm expressing the results in terms of percent various variance explained. Um, it's not in R squared, strictly speaking, because this is from random forest, so it's sort of a pseudo R squared. Typically, when you run the same variables through a regression model, you'll get a higher R squared um, because we tend to select the best models. But because random forest bootstraps, you actually get a more conservative estimate of variance explained. Uh, Chromebook density, here's Aster and LiDAR. It's just barely better 
combining them than just using LIDAR alone. For canopy base height, it's you know better again combining them. And for coarse woody debris, actually, you'd be better off excluding the the um, aster. LIDAR alone had higher variance explained. Okay, so now what I thought to do, all right, so I got my course with a debris map of, you know, some questionable accuracy, because it's just an ancillary variable to the tree biomass imputation model. And now here we've explicitly predicted course with a debris, from LIDAR and ASTER. How do these maps compare? Well, the patterns look quite a bit different. The top one is a lot noisier. The bottom one looks cleaner. It looks better. Is it better? <coughs> well, I summarized those predictions to the stand level again and did a scatter plot of that and found a serious bias. Uh, on the left, or I should say the y axis, this is the imputation result. And on the x axis, this is the um, regression result. These are both random forest, okay? One is classification mode, run through imputation, and on the x-axis is what Mike and I worked on in regression mode. This is just LIDAR, all right? The asters out of the equation now because LIDAR alone proved better. So how do we explain this bias? Well, I thought this was pretty interesting because I've been noticing the same problem with regression um, in my biomass models where I was getting biased estimates. And I've seen it also um, with multiple regression, getting biased estimates relative to imputation. So this made me trust the imputation map more. Now here's a robust, more robust way to test for bias in your model. This is an equivalence plot. It's the same scatter plot as before, the same variables. But it actually boots, it does a simple linear regression between your observed and your predicted and generates confidence intervals around the two terms in a linear regression model, the slope and the intercept. The gray box here indicates the confidence in the intercept term. So it's centered over the mean. And the dotted lines here are confidence intervals in the slope term. So this is a really poor comparison. The, there's a little error bar here down below this big gray region. Because it's outside the region, that means it's, it, they are significantly dissimilar data sets. And because this black slope line is outside the confidence intervals, there's also significant disproportionality between those predictions. I, I trust the imputation model more because, again, we didn't see evidence of bias in the imputation model at the plot level. The course of debris, observers have predicted, is pretty consistent. And finally, I want to say a few words about bark beetle defoliation. How might that affect the canopy lighter signal? We just started this study, and now this study has three different scales. We are looking at a continental scale, at bark beetle impacts, um, focusing on areas in Alaska, Oregon, uh, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, and Arizona, where we have specific study areas. And we chose areas where we also have some LIDAR data, so we can look at um, Fine, finer resolution effects of bark beetle defoliation on <coughs> predictions of, say, basal area. This map here is at our biggest scale. This is a, um, a climate-driven prediction of lodful pine distribution. So this is where lodful pine currently occurs, or I should say 2000, based on 2000 climate, using climate predictors. The little polygons represent um, Little's vegetation map. And there was better than 95% correspondence between the uh, predicted lodful pine 
distribution, which you know the host species, and Little's map. So that's 2000. Here's 2030. This, you know, by linking that climate model, and that's actually a random forest model too, using climate predictors, linking that climate model to global um, general circulation models, we can project, you know, what's going to happen with climate change. Where would we, using that existing climate profile relationship, where would you expect logical climate to occur? And that's this is what the map's going to look like in 2030. This is 2060, and this is 2090. So in America, our strategy to the bark beetle problem is to keep burning fossil fuels, keep driving around, shoveling the coal into the power plants, and we'll just chase the host species up here to Canada. We won't have any more bark beetles. So now, just some more graphs to show you what happens to the uh, random forest prediction with LIDAR. Now, these plots are generated from um, some plots in Arizona. Severe defoliation. The spruce fir forest down there in the Pinalino Mountains of Arizona, um, east of Tucson, uh, pretty much they're wiped out. And if you, But it's really interesting. When you look at the metrics that are being selected to predict basal area, and this is explained 72% of variation. Look at the intensity metrics popping out here. Now these have been normalized for intensity. And you know I'm used to seeing mean height, upper canopy, height percentiles um, in my models. Now in a defoliated forest, look at all these intensity metrics popping out. So that was illuminated right there. And the few elevation metrics that are popping out, you know, from the canopy heights are low level ones. I mean, first percentile, 10th percentile, 5th percentile, that's near the ground. So that's percent dead basal area. So I took total basal area, and or I took the percent basal area that was dead trees in the plot divided by the total. Now what if I don't use the intensity metrics? Then what's Next most powerful are density. And I apologize for these all these horrible variable names here. Um, these results, I got them the day before I came here. And I just, these are fusion outputs, OK? So maybe you've seen similarly, similarly named variables. But anyway, I apologize for not renaming these. But anyway, these top ones are density measures. So when you see percentage returns above 1.37, that's that big canopy density metric. And below 0.15, that just means the ground. So percent ground. That's basically the inverse of canopy density. And then these lower, these low level height metrics again. Very different from a healthy forest. This is canopy bulk density. Again, the density metrics, as is not too surprising, are the best predictors. And then this slew of intensities, too. There's, there's a big difference in intensity between green trees and defoliated trees or red trees. So um, our plots actually do a pretty good job of sampling the range of mortality that's out there. And so that's why it's getting picked up here. And then finally, if we just throw out the intensity metrics to see which height or density metrics get picked, Again, it's density. Density is much more important than height itself in these models. So in conclusion, I hope I relayed you the importance of scale and sampling issues, You know, like having similarly sized model and math units, thinking about the scale of the LiDAR data. And you know, here in Alberta, you're going to be doing plot level type analyses. Field data, they are at least as important as the LiDAR. You know, LiDAR gives you height, gives you canopy cover as physical measurements, but diameters are what you need for most attributes. And for fuel attributes too, you need field data. You're not going to go far without field data, no matter what the resolution of your LiDAR for, for predicting fuel attributes. So the quality of your models is 
I found much more a function of your field data than the LIDAR. Using LIDAR is abused into different packages. Um, it pays to like think about that, put some planning into how you want to strategize your LIDAR workflow, your data processing workflow. And Chris has talked a lot about that. LIDAR is more sensitive to variability in canopy fuels than surface fuels. Um, that's obvious. But you know, through clever modeling techniques, we can actually get maps of surface fuels. And sometimes a manager just, just really needs a map. You know, but I throw those cautions out there to how accurate they are. And then density and intensity metrics really are going to be more important, I think, for um, mapping bark beetle to foliated canopies, more so than the height metrics. So that's, that's the lesson I've learned so far there in that regard. And then just tools. This is my last slide. Um, I've mentioned MCC. You need to classify your LIDAR. I've mentioned fusion and the standalone fusion <coughs> metrics that we have in SourceForge. A tool that has not been mentioned here so far, I don't think, is VCAL. This is an NB extension, so it's written in IDL and it does some useful things. It has an intensity normalization procedure that's just dreadfully slow right now. But that people are working to speed that up. LAS tools. Uh, this hasn't been mentioned yet either to my knowledge, and I'm surprised because um, there's incredible functionality with command line tools in this LAS tools package. And this is a it's a one-man show as far as I can tell. Martin Eisenberg has developed these tools, and he, I mean, you can send a request to the discussion group, how do I do this? And either that day or the next day, he'll either answer it or he's coded the function to do it. And my technician and I sort of joke, Martin just he sits there by the computer and he's got a toaster there and a pile of pop tarts. <laughs> it's just, you know, he's he's really gung ho. And it's a fabulous, fabulous package. Open topography, this is a big supercomputing center in San Diego, and they are um, hosting data and they're also hosting software development. And then USGS Click, um, that's sort of a little bit stagnant in the aisle right now, but it is a resource and 